In this week's video I show you some findings that are frequently missed or not reported by many radiologists. So this is the first patient and what we are looking for is an incidental finding so don't focus on all these degenerative changes here in the midfoot and in the ankle joint and here also in this part of the ankle with this effusion etc etc so this is not the point we are looking for some accessory findings here and basically already on this image you should clearly see what i'm talking about i give you a second here and if you bought and actually read my book you will certainly know what i'm referring to here so basically if you don't see any abnormality don't feel bad because your mind is tricking you and it's best shown here if i scroll through you have these degenerative changes that's all right but there is an obvious finding and it's quite big and what it is it's this structure here and once you see it you cannot unsee it here so we have a large muscle here which typically is not there but because it's looking like muscle and tendon and it actually is muscle and tendon your mind does not perceive it as a pathology so we have the normal tendons, the, the peroneal tendons, the flexor tendons, so the PTT, then the flexor digitorum longus and the flexor hallucis longus here, and then the accessory soleus here. This is the Achilles tendon with the normal soleus and this is just the accessory soleus muscle with its corresponding tendon inserting here uh, onto the medial aspect of the calcaneus. So it's very important to always have a look at this region for accessory muscles because they can be quite frequent. In the case of the soleus accessorius, it has been reported in about 5% of cases. So if you see a few ankle joints, you will certainly encounter this at one point or another. It can be of clinical significance uh, because patients might present with a mass and this is certainly one of the differential diagnoses here in this region. Sometimes they also have pain if they do a lot of exercise because the muscle might swell a little bit and there is not enough space for all the muscles to be in and there is the tension on the muscular fascia. At least that's, that's one of the theories. You can clearly see here the normal soleus here, outlined here by the tendon, Achilles tendon, normal muscle here. And all of this is the accessory muscle. And if you just look at this image, you can just miss it because it looks normal. And it actually is normal in a way. So this is an soleus accessorius. The funny thing about this muscle is that you can already suspect it or at least hint to it on plane films as in this case. So here we had this radiograph with all the normal stuff there, but normally you have this triangular fatty tissue here just in front of the Achilles tendon. And here we have some soft tissue structure here. And if I window this a little bit more, then you can clearly see here sharply outlined. So we have a long mass here and already we suspected here an accessory soleus muscle. And here side by side, you can clearly see that exactly this stuff here corresponds to this muscle here. So the accessory soleus is not the only accessory muscle in that region as you might already know and this is just another patient here this is proximally let's scroll distally and see when or where you see a variant and at least at this point you should realize that something is not as it typically should be and it's very subtle this time if you don't look for it, you will not see it, but if you look for it, you will certainly see it every time. And let's again count the tendons. So we have Tom, Dick and Harry, peroneal tendons, Achilles tendon, so far so good. But what's this here? So we have still a muscle going down here below the ankle joint line, which is not part of the posterior tibial tendon, the flexor digitorum longus or the flexor hallucis longus. So this here is a flexor digitorum accessorius longus, FDAL. It's another common variant and its prevalence is somewhere between 2 to 8 percent. The difference to the accessory soleus muscle is this time this muscle lies below the flexor retinaculum and therefore runs within the tarsal tunnel and if it's big enough it might even cause a crowding here and lead to a tarsal tunnel syndrome. 
So carefully look for this muscle here below the flexor retinaculum, whereas the accessory soleus in the previous case was outside of this retinaculum in this region here. And this is the next patient. And again, uh, as you might already guess, we are looking for a muscular variant. You scroll down and already here you can see, wait a minute, we have four tendons here in the back. We have the normal peroneal tendons, the Achilles tendon, we have the Tom, Dick and Harry. And here is another tendon with a large accessory muscle attached to it here. This one here. Again, this one here also runs below the flexor retinaculum and going down here, attaching somewhere onto the calcaneus. But frequently you will not really identify where these accessory muscles insert anyways. And there is a variety and different variants of insertion. So they might insert onto the bone. They might insert into the other tendons or muscles in this region. And basically it's not so important. So here is another variant and this time it's called a peroneo calcaneus internus PCI and it's less common than the other ones that I have shown you so far. It has been reported in up to 1% of cases. Again below the retinaculum. So it does not run just next to the neurovascular structures here but if it's big enough it might compress these structures by replacing or by pushing the flexor hallucis longus in this direction and therefore compressing the neurovascular structures here in an indirect way. And here is the next patient and you guessed it, it's another muscle. This time I give you a second again, where is it? And as you already know, Tom, Dick and Harry, that's the obvious choices. And we can see this time there is no accessory muscle here. The neurovascular structures here are not paralleled by an additional muscle, all right? Perineal tendons, but this time we have an accessory muscle here with a little, little tendon running down here, tac, 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 and inserting here onto the retrotrochlear eminence. And this is a peroneus quartus. So the accessory peroneus quartus muscle is basically a accessory tendon in the course of the normal peroneal tendons and sometimes the nomenclature is not quite straightforward and some use different names and some just use peroneus quartus for any muscle here that is accessory in this region. At least that's what I'm doing because there's no point in differentiating this variant from all these other subtypes and you can see the list um, on the red source article. The prevalence of the peroneus quartus is up to one in four patients, so it's very common and frequently also not described. Sometimes the insertion is even at other uh, sites, but again, it's not really important. I think it's just important to realize that there is an additional muscle, certainly to train your eye for this. To summarize, on this slice here, we have all these different variants in one image. and. Just train your eye and try to see which one is which. You can pause the video and I will go through them and how we can differentiate them here just one more time. And I think it's important because um, sometimes at least two of them can be not so easy to differentiate. Now, obviously here, the first case, Tom, Dick and Harry, nothing else, accessory, tendon here along the peroneal tendons, which is not the case on the other patients, except for this one here. This is the peroneus quartus. And because it's very easy to differentiate, it's just running along the peroneal tendons, I'm gonna delete it right now. And these three here are now the ones that can be a little bit more difficult sometimes to separate. So the first thing you need to know is, is this accessory muscle deep to the flexor retinaculum or superficial to the flexor retinaculum? And as you can see here, obviously this one is deep. This is all right. And in this patient here, we have the flexor retinaculum here. We scroll through, we can see this muscle here is also deep to the flexor retinaculum. And in this patient here, 
don't be fooled that this is the flexor retinaculum because the flexor retinaculum is running here along here but it's sometimes not so easy but certainly at least at this point you realize it's not there and this one here lies outside of the flexor retinaculum and therefore this is the soleus accessorius or the accessory soleus muscle so we are left with these two here and one key element here is the peroneocalcaneus internus originates from the fibula so it's coming from pretty far laterally and therefore lies laterally, la laterally to the flexor hallucis longus and has no direct contact with the neurovascular bundle and if it's large it pushes the FHL here in this direction medially and indirectly compresses it there. So that's the PCI and on the other hand the flexor digitorum accessorius longus lies more dorsally to the FHL and not laterally as the PCI and has contact here to the neurovascular structures and might therefore compress them directly. So that's one way to make this distinction. It's always the same with anatomic variants. They might not be really important because many people have them, patients have it since birth and typically they don't manifest as a pathology in that way. But I think it's still important that we as radiologists first of all notice them and also write them in our report because it shows us or it shows to our colleagues that we are actually looking at the image very carefully. And if we see the anatomic variant, we might be more likely to see the relevant pathology as well. So I think it's important. So if you see it, put it in the report. If you don't put it in your report, let me know in the comments below why. So before we close up this week, something on a more personal note here, I see many comments regarding the image quality, which is pretty good to be honest and people ask me what scan we use or uh, what sequences etc etc but to be honest I'm not really interested in this MR physics stuff and all the sequences and MR etc etc um, sorry guys but I have a good friend it's back again and he just started his YouTube channel and he has many many very good videos and really nice examples of what MR images could look like and uh, basically even with the same equipment as you have he really gets the best out of the machine and he you might know him from LinkedIn where he's very active and he recently started also his YouTube channel so go check it out and also make sure you subscribe to his channel and with that thanks for watching and see you next week